Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. Um, this is my second time in Germany, and my family's German, so it's always a pleasure to be uh, here. Um, despite having taken four years of German in high school, um, my German isn't that good. I didn't practice it much, uh, so I will try to speak slowly. Um, as Sebastian said, uh, the program says I'm an engineer. I'm, I, my background is actually uh, build-release engineering. Uh, I've got about 15 years' experience in build-release engineering. This slide is really about my Twitter handle, uh, J. Paul Reed on Twitter, so you can tweet me feedback uh, as, as the presentation is going on. And as Sebastian mentioned, I've been privileged to work with uh, organizations of all shapes and sizes uh, and in all sorts of industries, really helping them figure out what the DevOps means to them. Um, if podcasts are your thing, we have a podcast called The Chip Show, um, where we talk about build, engineering, DevOps, release management, and everything in between. So you can check that out if you uh, do podcasts. So uh, it's right after lunch. Uh, have all that good food. Um, I want to uh, run a little survey because, uh, as was mentioned, I, I speak all over the, the world. Uh, so it's always good to know your audience. So raise your hand if you are a developer. Okay. Raise your hand if you're an operations person. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you're uh, support, like QA, release engineering, customer support, something like that. A couple of release engineers in here, yes. I was like seeing that. Uh, how about the business? If you would consider yourself the business managers, that sort. Oh, okay. One, one lone hand maybe going up. Two, okay. Uh, any others? If you wouldn't categorize yourself in any of those buckets? No? Okay, good. I think we got all the buckets. Awesome. Okay. So for the second part, uh, get out a writing utensil if you have one or, or the notes app on your phone. Uh, uh, because I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to write down your answer uh, when, we, when we do that. So take a second out your phone. And what I want to ask you is, write down the first words that come to your mind when you hear or see the word DevOps. So I'll give you, I'll give you a couple seconds to do that. Okay, so set that aside because we'll come back to it. We'll take a look at that in a second. So this month is actually DevOps's sixth birthday. Uh, it's been quite a journey. And thinking back on six years, I actually uh, kind of did that Google trick that you often see where you put uh, a search terms into Google and see what other people are searching on. So uh, my six-year-old is mean, driving me crazy, stealing, or lazy. Does anyone feel like DevOps makes them feel like <laughs> this, driving me crazy, or, or DevOps is lazy? Um, it's, it's kind of interesting, right? As, as DevOps matures, the big question has really been on, can we scale it? Uh, does it apply to the enterprise? Does it apply when, when your engineering organization is 2,000 or 5,000 engineers? Uh, this was actually an article uh, from two, uh, 2014 uh, in May uh, from CIO Journal saying, uh, it's not going to work for enterprises. Um, that's been a really big focus in 2015 about how can we uh, scale this, bring it to the enterprise. A lot of the enterprise companies want uh, what DevOps professes to provide. So there's been a lot of uh, focus on that. I, this was another article saying enterprise DevOps is real. Uh, ironically, this article was published just a month after, in 2014, after the other article. So there's a, kind of this constant kind of feud going on. Um, but it's also uh, almost like DevOps is uh, growing up. So, of course, what do you do as your child grows up? You send it to school. So I asked Google, my, my kindergartner doesn't listen in school, is being bullied, is crying at school, is exhausted. And it's kind of interesting to think, is, is, do, do any of these describe DevOps right now? Is DevOps being bullied by the enterprise? Um, is DevOps crying at school? So there's this real sort of identity crisis. This is a, an article Baron Schwartz wrote about um, the DevOps identity crisis. He wrote it at the beginning of this year. And again, 2015 has been the year of trying to sort of figure this out. Um, this article argues that we need a manifesto, except the DevOps community really pushes back against having a manifesto. Um, this is a O'Reilly editor, Mike Lukides, who, who tries to define DevOps by the negative space. Um, he says, I might try to define DevOps as the movement that doesn't want to be defined. So a lot of times we talk about uh, what DevOps isn't. We don't talk so much about what DevOps is. And that's often really hard because if you're trying to implement it some way, somewhere or, or in your team, how can you implement it if we only talk about what it isn't? 
So Patrick DeBroff, if you don't know him, he coined, he's often called the godfather of DevOps. He coined the word, De- word DevOps six years ago. He said, I think I'm slowly outgrowing DevOps and I'm moving into a philosophy of IT. This was in 2014. He was already starting to tire of the word. Uh, I think it's interesting later he, he um, tweeted, imagine vendors horror when we decide to rename DevOps like we did with Hudson and Jenkins. It's apt to note that uh, the reason the Hudson Jenkins thing was renamed was because uh, Oracle uh, took over uh, Hudson. And, and so, uh, again, this corporate influence and they decided to change the name because of that. So six years in, we're experiencing some tension. Should we have a manifesto? Should we not have a manifesto? Kind of like capital A Agile. Do we define it? Uh, how can we know what it is if we don't define it? So this is really the source of the tension. How do we scale DevOps up and out? Um, a lot of organizations kind of want DevOps in a box. This is a, a DevOps complete DevOps certification kit from Amazon. You can buy it. It costs $299 if you're curious. Um, there's another company saying you can download the DevOps. So just download it and, and uh, it'll be all, all fine. Um, but really, uh, these companies want to replicate it, uh, the experiences that we hear about. Now, who's familiar with the term unicorn companies? A few, all right. So uh, w- what I find very interesting is that, that in the States uh, and a lot of DevOps conferences, we constantly talk about the unicorn companies. And it's this idea that there are these sort of mythical creatures that, uh, that if uh, we could only figure out how to replicate them or figure out their secret, their unicorn secret, we could all do it. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes about the unicorn and horse dichotomy, right? We all work for organizations that we might consider horses. If there's anything all horses hate, it's hearing stories about the unicorns. Um, Gene Kim, uh, author of The Phoenix Project, likes to say unicorns are just trained horses. When I hear of unicorn companies, I often actually think of this big, fat unicorn eating cash. So what are some of the unicorn companies that we talk about. Uh, does it, yeah, shout out some if you know one. Slack. Slack. Slack's an interesting one. I've never heard someone uh, suggest Slack, but I would agree, Slack is one. And, what? Airbnb. Airbnb, yes, yeah. Etsy, yep, all right. So I'll tell you something interesting. Um, in Europe, Airbnb, Uber, haven't heard Slack before, that's a good one though. Airbnb and Uber come up. Um, in the States, pretty much all these come up. And Air- Airbnb and Uber don't come up as much. So I just think that's, that's kind of interesting to point out. But yes, Etsy, Facebook. We heard a lot about Netflix uh, the other day, uh, yesterday. Um, there's some lesser known unicorns as well. Uh, this was a case study that I did uh, called DevOps in Practice on Nordstrom and, and Texas.gov. They have a lot of the same benefits that you see or have experienced the same benefits that you see with DevOps, um, but you don't know about them. Jez Humble uh, likes to say unicorns are just horses with better public relations, and maybe that's, that's true. So back to these, these mythical creatures that we talk about. How many people have tried to take the techniques or patterns from one of these companies and implement it in their own environment? Yeah, I see hands going up. Um, they'll say, you know, look, how, look at how Netflix does DevOps or look at the DevOps architecture that Facebook has. Well, what does that mean? So I wanted to go back to basics to try to sort of figure that out. So I asked 50 people in the DevOps community that we might consider thought leaders. And if I listed them all, there would be names that you would certainly recognize. They spend their time thinking about DevOps. Uh, and, and I asked the question that I asked you, what words come to mind when you hear DevOps? So... This is a word cloud of their answers. Uh, a couple words stand out there, don't they? Culture, collaboration, automation. Empathy is pretty big. Feedback loops. Now, how many people had one word in common with what's on this chart? How about two words? How about three words? Okay. How many people uh, had a word in a different language? Right? This is all English. How many people put down... A word in a different language. That's interesting. I don't see any hands. So some of the other funny words on this that might be harder to see because they're smaller. Uh, bullshit is on here. Uh, sigh is on here. <laughs> oh no is on here. Uh, enterprise corruption is on here, as in the enterprise is corrupting DevOps. So why is looking at language important? Why did I ask you and why did I ask the, the quote-unquote thought leaders what words come to mind? Well, 
Dave Snowden is an academic doing a lot of work in complexity theory. And in John's keynote yesterday, he talked about the Kenevan model. Dave Snowden is the creator of the Kenevan model. Um, he said the language of description is the language of intervention. So for us to intervene, to change a culture, change a team, change a process or a situation, we need to be able to describe it. We need to be able to talk about it with a shared language. So a lot of people, when they look at the title of this presentation, they'll say, oh, aesthetics. Well, first of all, what is that? And what does that have to do with, with anything about DevOps? So simple, I, I did what everybody does when they're defining words, look on Wikipedia. A branch of philosophy dealing with the nature of art, beauty, and taste, and the nature of creation, the appreciation of beauty. Sometimes they refer to it as the study of sensory or sensory emotional values. So... Why do we care about this? Well, it's interesting. There's lots of different types of aesthetics. Experimental aesthetics is actually the oldest, um, uh, er second oldest area in psychology. It was actually a, a German um, psychiatrist who, who pioneered that area. And that's the idea of studying how we experience aesthetics, right? If we look at a painting or hear a piece of music, what sort of emotional response or reaction do we have? Neuroaesthetics is much newer. That's the idea that uh, we can look at things from a science point of view. We can put people in functional MRIs, tell them things, let them hear things, and look at what the brain actually does when we expose them to that stimuli. Now, applied aesthetics is what we're going to be talking about, and it's what we're interested in. And it's the, the area that we often think of aesthetics, fashion, TV shows, gastronomy, if you're, if you're a foodie. What's interesting is that there's a couple of areas uh, that in our space, in IT, there's a, a bunch of studies that have been done uh, on websites, icons, web browsers, the layout of a web browser. They've done studies on the aesthetics of that. One new area that I find really interesting is source code. They've started looking at the aesthetics of source code. And if you're an engineer, a lot of times you might look at uh, a piece of source code and say that it's beautiful or not beautiful. So we've been starting to sort of dig into what do we mean when we say that. So we, I could spend the whole presentation talking about different types of aesthetics, but I won't. Um, I want us to think about aesthetics in the context which we work, which is the operational context uh, in providing a particular service. So when you look at other operational fields, uh, this is Haneda Airport in uh, Tokyo, a time lapse. Patterns begin to emerge. You can see patterns. Certain things are very chaotic. Certain things are much more ordered. It's really a symphony of agents in an environment using tools and dealing with external forces. And of course, processes accrete over time. We see collection of, of as things get repeated, we sort of see these things accrete in our, our processes and systems. A friend of mine described this best as saying, there's beauty in things done well. And so that's what we sort of want to talk about when, when we're talking about the aesthetics of DevOps. Now back to the unicorns for a second. If you had to describe Facebook's values in a phrase, what would it be? Anyone know? They always used to talk about move fast and break things. Now, this was their sort of slogan, their ethos for, for years. Um, and then recently they sort of changed it to move fast with stable infrastructure. Um, I have to say, I don't know that I believe that deep down the engineers that have been there for years still don't believe move fast and break things is the way to go, but that's what they say. Um, one of the other uh, ethos that they have is you can't tell developers no. This comes from uh, an engineer there named Phil Dib Dibowitz, who is an infrastructure engineer, and he's given um, a number of talks about how at, at uh, Facebook, you really can't tell an engineer no. They they can do whatever they want. And he gives the example of down to imagine, uh, managing the sys CDLs, the sys cuddles on Linux uh, across their entire infrastructure. They give engineers the power to do that. And so when an engineer came and said, I want to do this, they couldn't say no. They had to find a way to make it work. And they did. He's got a couple of talks about that. And the way that they do that is, is fascinating. So let's take a look at Netflix. Uh, what about Netflix? Anyone know their, their big, big thing that you hear all the time? Freedom and responsibility. These things that we're going to look at actually come out of their culture deck. John Willis in the panel yesterday referenced their culture deck. You should look at Netflix's culture deck, uh, even if just to see what they profess and compare it with your own culture. Um, a lot of these things come uh, from there. It's like 150 slides, but it's pretty easy to go through. There's a lot of interesting sort of nuggets in there, and this all comes from that. Freedom and responsibility. Context, not control. 
And uh, this was mentioned yesterday. Adequate performance gets a generous severance package. That might not work in all company cultures, but at Netflix, that's the way it is. Finally, let's look at Amazon um, and their, their particular cultures. So um, data-driven always. They are big on data. They are very upfront about the fact that they make decisions based on data. And if you don't have data, it's going to be problematic for you to make an argument for them to do something. A DD leader who will enforce strategy. This sort of comes from the memo in, I think it was 2002. Jeff Bezos sending out a memo saying everything will be a service. Uh, you will not expose any direct uh, implementation. It will be a service that's callable. Uh, that's a very famous memo. What is less famously known is that he actually hired someone who was an ex-military colonel to go to the teams and make sure that they were actually doing that. Um, kind of interesting. Put in your four years, dot, dot, dot. So what this reference is, there was an article in the New York Times a couple months ago about the harsh conditions uh, at, at Amazon. They tell a story of a woman who had cancer and was put on a performance plan uh, because she had cancer and wasn't at work very often because she was dealing with that issue. Um, so uh, it's the idea that you put in your four years, they kind of burn you out, and that's sort of expected. Uh, that's known when you go into their culture. That's just kind of the way they operate. So what's notable here is that we consider all of these successful organizations um, unicorn companies, but their professed values, what they find beautiful, are all very different. None of those, those slogans are really similar to each other. So I said this at, at uh, DevOps Days Rockies earlier this year, culture is not important, but cultural alignment is critical. I was actually wrong when I said that. A better way to say it is cultural, uh, culture is not important, but a shared aesthetic is critical. And you might ask yourself, well, what's the difference? That seems like the th same thing. Um, Snowden, uh, the complexity uh, guy that we were talking about before, uh, actually makes a big deal about alignment can be dangerous in a complex system because it reduces the adaptive capacity of that system. If everybody is completely aligned, then you actually reduce your ability to adapt to a changing world. So shared aesthetic is actually a better way to communicate what I was saying. So what are your aesthetics of DevOps? Uh, take a moment and think about it. Um, would they include any of the words that you thought about before? Um, what are your team's aesthetics of DevOps? What are your organizations? Would you describe them as shared? Do you share the same aesthetics that your team shares at DevOps or your company for that matter? So the same people that I was talking about before, those 50 or so thought leaders, uh, I asked them what their aesthetics of DevOps were. And I'm going to read about six of them. And I want you to pay particular attention to what, ma what overlaps and actually what doesn't overlap. So the deep collaborata collaboration between groups to serve the customer better. One of the other people said DevOps as a kata, understanding the form your organization needs to turn from practice into muscle memory. One of the other ones said a holistic view of modern production as a complex process beyond tasks, effort, pride, and results. I, I thought the pride was particularly interesting. This is very uh, human-focused. DevOps requires generosity and humility. Sharing is hard, especially when what you're sharing isn't perfect. I see DevOps as beautiful when it brings people together. Um, I thought this next one was particularly interesting because it talks about the organizational system as a whole, but it also talks about uh, the company and it takes into account economic performance and employee satisfaction. So improving the health and fitness of the whole organization from economic performance to employee satisfaction. Um, DevOps epitomizes the ideas of empathy and cooperation. It, call, it calls people to work together, breaking down the silos that exist, and making people more aware of the humanity that exists behind the code. I, I find this one interesting because uh, this particular person talks about humanity. It's very important to uh, their particular uh, aesthetic of DevOps. There's only a couple more of these. The amazing DevOps outcomes that we love so much, high daily deploys, high reliability, lack of friction, are what results when we keep pushing towards single piece flow and then a reference to lean manufacturing. So this is interesting. This talks about lean manufacturing. This person's ethos about DevOps is very much tied to Deming and, and the Toyota production system. This is one of my favorite ones. DevOps at this juncture is in the eye of the beholder, which I think is really the case as we can see. So I won't tell you 
who said what. Uh, but these are these are uh, the people that we uh, that uh, their survey answers that we just read. Uh, but isn't the variation fascinating? Uh, all the different things that they look at. Um, note the threads of sort of shared aesthetic, but uh, they are in some sense aligned. But I don't think they're aligned in the way that you might consider us talking about alignment in a business when we talk about is the company aligned. So let's talk about some commonly shared DevOps aesthetics. Automation, obviously, I think there's been a number of talks here about that. Infrastructure as code, this idea that we should be able to build our servers from some code uh, and, and be able to put configuration management in place. Systems thinking, value streams, this idea that we take an entire look at from commit all the way through to production, what does that look like? That's very important. Feedback loops, reducing feedback loops so we can get better data and, and make better decisions. Collaboration and empathy, that's a big deal, I think. We talk a lot about that. Winning and recognizable improvement. I like that the subtitle of the Phoenix Project is uh, helping or using DevOps to help your business win or something to that effect. So these are some aesthetics that might be a little uh, more difficult to agree upon. VI versus Emacs. Application architectures, microservices, uh, um, service-oriented architecture, containers, all of that stuff. Who is allowed to say no? We've talked about that with developers and operations people, not the ops people not being allowed to say no. Humanity and humane systems design. So the idea that uh, this plays into conversations about when you're on call uh, and you're, being, you're paging people at three in the morning and waking them up. Um, that's not a very humane way to operate your system. So the sort of uh, discussions come in in that context. Inclusivity and diversity. A lot of people think DevOps has some aspect of Diversity or inclusivity and in others don't it's kind of interesting When to slow down When should we as an organization or a team actually go slower? I like to call these elephant conversations uh, I don't know if, if you have a colloquialism for that here uh, in Germany, but uh, the elephant in the room uh, Maybe it's the same um, this idea that uh, that uh, these are these things that we live with all all the time But sometimes we don't directly reference even though it is that elephant in the room um, this is a quote from Shanley. Uh, she does a lot of work on uh, culture, talks a lot about uh, culture and technology. And I, I thought it was interesting. Our true culture is made primarily of things no one will say. Culture is about power dynamics, unspoken priorities and beliefs, mythologies, conflicts, enfor enforcement of social norms, creation of in-out groups, and distribution of wealth and control inside companies. This is the quintessential elephant conversation. These things that we don't often talk about, even though they actually control the way that we work and the way that our teams do it's our work. Um, this is a quote from a book called The No Asshole Rule. It's written by a Stanford professor. It's quite a good book. Uh, if, if you um, um, are curious, I would recommend it. Um, the single best uh, question for testing an organization's character is what happens when people make mistakes? We've talked a lot about failure here at the conference and how, uh, how we react to that. So you might ask yourself, what's your team or company's aesthetic regarding failure? So um, I was actually lucky that John uh, preceded me with his keynote because he actually talked about uh, loose taxonomies. Uh, so if you saw his keynote, you probably saw this. And he brought up the idea of cams and ice. Um, I wanted to bring up, I think, the original loose taxonomy that we talk about in DevOps is tools and culture. We hear this repeatedly, DevOps is tools and culture, tools and culture. Uh, this is from April 2013. This is uh, Mandy Walls uh, and her uh, report on building the DevOps culture. And of course, she talks about tools and culture that facilitate that. So who's heard of CAMS? Yeah? Okay, cool. Some hands going up. So uh, CAMS, uh, if John didn't go through it, culture, automation, metrics, and sharing. And it's interesting to sort of put these two uh, things into the original kind of loose taxonomy of tools and culture. So culture, obviously, is going to go in culture. Um, automation, usually very a, a tools-based conversation, uh, a lot of talking about the technology. Metrics and measurement, that is uh, often a, a tools-based conversation. We actually had a couple of good sessions uh, here about um, uh, measuring and, and monitoring and how you do that with microservices. Uh, sharing, that is obviously a cultural distinction and issue. Um, so, CAMs. Now, John also talked about a new one, uh, 
a new loose taxonomy called ICE. Uh, Dave Zwiebeck described it earlier this year. Uh, and so inclusivity, right? That falls fair, firmly under uh, culture, I think. Now, complexity is kind of a weird beast. So we'll come back and look at that in a sec. I don't think it fits in either. Uh, and then, of course, uh, empathy is firmly in the cultural aspect. So let's go back to this uh, complexity thing. Complexity is coming up because we're coming to the realization that we all work in complex systems. Um, and in fact, we, all, we call them complex, techno, uh, uh, complex socio-technical systems. This idea that there's humans doing things in our system, so there's this aspect of social interaction and, and engagement within that technical system. Now, if we're trying to figure out what DevOps is, so we can spread it within our industry or within our organizations, there's an interesting note from complexity theory. We'll go back to Dave Snowden. One of the ways you change how people think is to change their tools. And of course, we've all experienced this, right? Our cell phone, what do we all do constantly when we need to check the time and kind of fidget with our, take our cell phones out, right? That's an example of a tool changing the way that we behave. Um, there's another funny story about uh, younger uh, children when they get a magazine, they look at it and they, they try to swipe because they think it's a broken iPad, right? So tools are really important. Um, this is a friend of mine, Justin uh, Barton, who's an um, archaeologist. He's getting his PhD in archaeology. And he, he was describing why artifacts are so important. They're critical because they represent and build society. They propagate it. They do exactly what we're talking about doing. The way we track cultural and human migration in a region is through tools and artifacts. So that's why that's really important. So we started talking about sort of the tension between the two. And now that we sort of understand the importance of aesthetics, I think it's clear that we really shouldn't be evaluating the art of DevOps as much as we should be evaluating the artifacts of DevOps. If we really want to figure out how to bring DevOps to our organizations and our teams, that's what's important. So let's talk about some artifacts of the DevOps movement. These are a bunch of them. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, uh, the, and of course, this is just a short list. These are some of the, the big ones. Uh, but I am going to talk about three of them that I think are really important. So this is uh, a work Matthew Skelton did on DevOps team topologies. And he was exploring uh, the idea that when we talk about a DevOps team or how DevOps gets implemented, what does that actually look like? He originally came up with six types of team topologies where you have mixing of Dev and Ops. You might have a, a fully embedded DevOps team, um, or you might have infrastructure as a service where you have kind of DevOps more on the dev side and operations. There's a little bit of overlap there. Um, one of his collaborators actually also proposed the uh, Google model, the SRE model. Um, and so DevOps team topologies are obviously uh, something that uh, is important when we're looking at this. So when you would look at it uh, in, in sort of the loose taxonomies, culture is obviously important because the topology of our teams fosters or discourages interactions, right? If you're embedded, you're going to have a different interaction than if you're a separate DevOps team. People may have heard of Conway's Law, uh, the idea that organizations uh, build systems that mimic their communications patterns. So that comes into play here. Tools are obviously a big thing. Uh, how do you communicate with bug trackers, email, Slack, that sort of thing. Tools for handoffs, you know, if you're doing handoffs between things. Um, in the complexity domain, do we know what complexity domain our teams are in? How would we transition the team from one to another? How would we insert a DevOps team if we wanted to manage that complexity? Oftentimes, again, we were talking about communication pathways. That's all a complex problem. So continuous delivery. We've talked a lot about continuous delivery here. It's big with enterprises. What I find interesting is the DevOps Enterprise Summit in San Francisco, they held it for the second time this year. A lot of big enterprises don't really talk a lot about DevOps. They talk more about continuous delivery. It's just kind of interesting that, that it's easier for them to talk about that as an as a artifact. So, of course, from a cultural perspective, uh, visibility, uh, continuous delivery brings visibility because there's a pipeline that everybody can see. Might rearrange some roles if you deploy a continuous delivery pipeline. Tools, there's lots we could talk about, continuous delivery tools. There's a bunch of vendors that uh, will talk about their continuous delivery tools and how they fit in. Um, so, obviously, there's tools there. It's interesting to consider from a complexity standpoint, is continuous delivery uh, as a practice attempting to move complex domains into a more ordered domain? 
That might be an interesting kind of conversational fodder. Is that really one of the side benefits of continuous delivery? So one of the final things that is really important, um, actually, uh, excuse me, I need you to put your phone down. Please, uh, can you put your phone down? Thanks. Now, who thought that interaction was uncomfortable or awkward? Yeah. And you're right. In a low-trust environment, you might see an interaction like that, and you might go, wow, Paul's a real jerk, right? In a neutral trust environment, you might say, huh, what's up with those two people? I don't know what's going on. That's, that seems weird. In a high trust environment, though, what you see over and over again is the reaction to that is, what's, what is going on there? I know both of those people don't normally act like that. What is going on? Is somebody having a bad day? And in the context, right, the point here is that context really matters. Um, in that example, uh, I might have been asking uh, Mark to put his cell phone down because I need him to come help me with the server problem. And I don't have time to explain that, so I'm, I'm just wanting him to help me. There's a myriad reasons for that. By the way, uh, let's do it. give Mark a round of applause. He said I could yell at him in the presentation, so appreciate it. Now, I want to give one other story that illustrates this point uh, pretty clearly that context is, is key. I was working with a team, and they had a no cell phones uh, in meetings policy. And they were, the team had all bought into it, and, and they were very adamant about this, really. I had all agreed to it. And I was there helping the team uh, with, some, with some DevOps stuff and some automation stuff. And a gentleman that I'd been working with for a couple weeks came in and uh, had his cell phone, and he kept nervously checking it during the meeting, which was odd because we had this rule and uh, we, we had all agreed to it. And I asked him after the meeting, what's going on? Um, you know, I saw you checking your cell phone a lot. And he was very honest with me and I appreciated his honesty. He said, you know, my wife had a miscarriage last night. And so I've been checking in with her to see how she's doing today. And at that point, we had a conversation about that, and we just said the team kind of collectively decided, go home, right? And the rest of the team took over the task that he had to complete that particular day because it was more important to go be with his family. So that's an example of where, in a high-trust environment, sometimes those interactions that we may not have a context for, really, the context is what gives us uh, to, uh, something to know whether or not it's a good interaction or a really bad interaction. So... Uh, I want to go back to artifacts for a sec. Uh, my friend, uh, the archaeologist, said, you know, a running joke among archaeologists, when we don't know what something is, we just call it ritual. When we find an artifact and we can't describe it, we just say it's ritual. Um, I find this kind of interesting because how much of uh, Agile, capital A Agile, do we do in our teams because it's ritual? Like that's what the book says to do, so we go do it. And we don't really evaluate whether or not it's working for us in our context. Um, another one that you might, you know, Netflix open source tools, they're great. They may be totally useless in your context. Uh, they don't really uh, work well with containers at all. They're, they're very AWS based and very AMI based. And if that's not your context, they're not going to work well for you. So DevOps, aesthetics, tools, culture, and artifacts. We've talked about a lot of those today, a lot, lot to think about. But I want to give you three takeaways. Don't avoid the elephant conversations, especially as they relate to shared aesthetics. Slow down to notice the differences in your aesthetics with your teammates and discuss those. I love this quote from John Allspaugh. Um, oh, that's just semantics, dismissively said by everyone who thinks words, language, and meaning don't matter. They do. Right? Pay attention to your artifacts. So understand the artifacts that you produce and you contribute to producing. You know, one important thing about the example that we had here is our interaction that you just saw, I created an artifact. And in the context of a team dynamic, we're all creating artifacts with our interactions. Pay attention to what those inter uh, interactions, those artifacts are. And look at them through the lens of a shared aesthetic. So does it contribute to the group aesthetic? Does it detract from the group aesthetic? Which, by the way, it's okay if it does, 
But you might find if, if you're trying to roll out a tool or roll out a particular procedure or process and you're not getting a lot of traction or buy-in from your teammates, it might be because it uh, doesn't meet the shared aesthetic that the team or the organization has uh, for whatever that tool or process might relate to. Is it an entirely new aesthetic? If it is, then you might roll it out differently or talk about it differently. You might have to acculturate and socialize it a little differently. And finally, keep context friend of mind. Um, you have to pay attention to the context, uh, or more importantly, you need to pay attention to your team's degree of context around a particular artifact that we talk about. So in this particular context, talking about the unicorns isn't particularly useful if you're not Batman with a dolphin army. By the way, I find it interesting. I was curious if people would find this photo amusing or not, because in the States, people always laugh. And I didn't hear anyone laughing, so maybe it's not as funny here. But uh, you may appreciate this. To Americans, 100 years is a long time. To Europeans, 100 miles is a long distance. Right? Again, context. So finally, whatever this process around artifacts and aesthetics and working through that together, whatever that is for you and your team, make sure that you take time to appreciate the beauty and things done well. Thanks. I want to I want to point out a couple very quick things. If you have any anonymous feedback, there's a link here. Uh, say at dot me, J. Paul Reed. You can give me anonymous feedback. I would appreciate it. Um, and the other thing, if you would like a copy of DevOps in Practice, there's a link uh, here to get an electronic copy. It's free. It's a free download. Um, so you can read the story of Nordstrom and Texas.gov. Thanks. Mm -hmm.